we're all dying. And so what better way to spend your time than to live, like to truly live, like whatever it is that you want to do, go and just fucking do the damn thing. Just do the damn thing already. This conversation is for you if you want more out of life and are scared to make a big change because change is scary. Fear of the unknown keeps us small. This conversation is for you if you want to win at the game of life. And if you don't know what that means, you will really, really shortly because we will give you the one secret code to unlock the powers of winning at life. And we will give you the one rule that will set you up for success. And that sounds nebulous and vague, and it will make perfect sense. Dr. Jeremy Goldberg and I explore what it means to win at life and not in the way that you think. I don't want you to be small. And I don't want your life to be small. It can be simple, but I want it to be big and vast and loving and connected. And I want more for you. And I want more for me. My name is Sean Galanos, and this is The Love Drive. Nah, man, I'm good. I'm just happy to be along for the ride and see where this ends up. (laughs) All right, Jeremy, please, please introduce yourself. Sure. So uh, I am Dr. Jeremy Goldberg. I am a recovering scientist. I am a ferocious never giver upper. I am a naive idealist. I am an eternal optimist. I'm a collector of silver linings. I write and rant and speak and coach and host workshops and retreats. I'm trying to make the world better than it was yesterday. I'm trying to make kindness cool and compassion popular. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I'm just trying to enjoy the ride and smile as much as possible. What does making kindness cool mean to you? So I'll step back. A couple years ago, I was in this airport and I was staring at this woman who was on the phone crying very loudly and hysterically by herself. And she was kind of at the gate surrounded by humans and she was just sobbing. And eventually she put the phone down and she just kept crying. And I was just standing there kind of waiting for my flight to board. And I was really affected by her emotion. And I wanted to do something to help her out but I had no idea what to do. And I was intimidated and all the voices in my head were judging me and whatnot. And so I wrote, I picked out a business card of mine and on the back of it, I wrote, it'll be okay and you will be too. And I went over to her and I gave her a little pat on the back and I gave her the card and we made eye contact and she was you know, teary eyed and emotional. And then I just turned around and walked away and never looked back. And I was, my heart was racing and I was freaking out. I was thinking about what she was thinking. I was thinking and I was judging myself that this woman thinks that I'm trying to pick her up in the airport while she's crying hysterically. You're an idiot. What are you doing? Leave her alone, etc. But at the same time, I was really affected by her and I wanted to help. And I thought that in that brief interaction that perhaps her life could have been a little bit better in knowing that she was not alone, in knowing that other people are around who care, etc. And then I boarded the flight and I started kind of daydreaming about what it would look like in an alternate reality, in a world where kindness was cool and compassion was popular. And I was thinking about The current reality in which I just witnessed a woman having a very significant emotional experience surrounded by people 
hundreds of people who are reading magazines and scrolling on their phones and ignoring her to a large extent. And I just thought that was so crazy and so weird that that's acceptable and normal. And I just started thinking about what would be an alternative solution? What would be a world where that didn't have to happen? Because I really sympathized with her in that moment. I've been that person in an airport, except, you know, my airport was a school or a conversation or a car or a supermarket or whatever. I've been there. I've I've felt alone and lonely and sad and sorrowful. And I just started daydreaming about what a different world would be. And so I started um, doing this little thing when I got home and I would write little notes on the back of my business cards and I would just leave them everywhere. I would leave them underneath windshield wipers and at supermarkets and I would give them to people randomly. And uh, I just called them like my, my little love bombs. And um, And I had this brand at the time called Long Distance Love Bombs. And that was my little way of actually doing something and of trying to make the world a little bit better. And I love the idea of surprise. I love the idea that somebody could just stumble upon this little bit of inspiration or encouragement at perhaps the right time when they're feeling lonely or, or horrible or whatever, and that it might encourage them to just keep breathing and just keep going. And um, and that's kind of how it all started for me. And from there, I started writing articles. I started an Instagram account. I started coaching. I started speaking. I started doing online courses. I have a podcast now. It's just been a very giant kind of snowball that has been steadily rolling towards trying to create a more empathetic, compassionate, and kind society, not only to each other, but to ourselves as well. Maybe to ourselves first. Yeah, man. More and more, I've been leaning in that direction in the work that I do. And my, my work has evolved more towards, yeah, self-kindness, self-compassion. And a lot of the one-on-one -on -one coaching I do now or the group programs are focused on that, right? If If we can sort ourselves out and heal our trauma and our pain and all of the beliefs that we have around the things that are keeping us small or angry or whatever then we can potentially express those good things out into the world, right? I have been thinking about this concept that we can only really love other people as, as much as we can love ourselves. I, I don't know, though. I, I go back and forth. Some days I think, you know, if you can really be disgusted with yourself, but really love a person in your life who inspires you or connects with you or cares about you in such a powerful way so as to inspire you and let you know that that kind of living is possible. I don't know. I kind of feel like you can love someone more than you love yourself, but perhaps you just don't realize how much you love yourself because it's covered in all of these layers of beliefs that aren't yours and thoughts that aren't true, but feel true and decades of wiring and programming that have kept you from recognizing and really holding yourself in that loving, compassionate space. That's a tough one because I know of people that are incredibly loving towards other people and just not really nice to themselves. Yeah, I know many. I mean, I am one on occasion. And I think that just becomes the work, right? Of recognizing those moments quicker and quicker and consciously choosing a different thought pattern, consciously choosing to stop that, right? And I think that's why life can be tricky is because it takes effort and diligence to stay the path, so to speak. Yeah. I'm just thinking about how I sort of extend a lot of grace and love towards other people and sometimes really don't speak that kindly to myself. And luckily that hasn't happened in a while, mm. but it still happens every now and then. Mm. And I think you're right. That's where the work is. It's to identify what what's that story. Yeah. What's that story? And like, whose voice is that in my head right now? That's one thing I've learned from meditation is that 
my brain and my mind and my ego are absolute crazy maniacal lunatics that are just running in the background all the time in my brain. It's like, I am a madman. You sit quietly alone with your thoughts long enough and you are going to be shocked at what the heck is going on inside your brain. And so for me, that's been a powerful practice in recognizing that I am not my thoughts. I am not even my beliefs, right? I'm not my past. I'm not my future. I'm not my Instagram following. I was listening to this thing the other day and one of the lines that stuck with me was, you are silence. You are silence. Like when all of it is calm, when all of it is quiet, when there's just kind of this nothingness, that's what you really are. And then we like to believe that we are a husband, a girlfriend, an employee, a guitar player, a pianist, an artist, um, somebody who's not good at remembering names, we're clumsy, etc. These are all just arbitrary judgments, but they're not necessarily true. Like what is true is not the same as what is truth, right? And this is a little bit of an existential rabbit hole, I suppose, or, you know, requires a, at least a limited literacy in speaking woo-woo. But I think more and more, I'm curious about the way that I talk to myself and the way that I experience the world. They're all just like lenses that I have learned to put on without even realizing they're on. And my work as I move forward and gain wisdom and practice what I preach and try to live my life better and happier and more whole, I think, is to consciously choose what lenses I want to see the world through and to recognize that at all times, in all ways, I have lenses on that are coloring or clouding my experience of myself and the world around me. And I think that's just super powerful to, to understand at a core level because it means that you can decide how you want to see the world. You can decide what believes, what beliefs you want to focus on. And that is so empowering. It just becomes a game. Like these are the rules of life. And then you, you get to win the game however you decide. <laughs> I know somebody, there's, there's somebody close to me in my life that has a very similar philosophy that life is a game. Totally. And she wakes up every morning going, okay, how am I going to play this game? Yeah. And I love it. I find it a little idealistic. Mm -hmm. I'm well-versed in the language of woo-woo. <laughs> uh, but I'm also very pragmatic and a little cynical. Yeah. And so I sometimes struggle with the idea that life is a game because that is sort of a perspective of people that are fairly privileged. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of people, it's not a game. Like it's literally trying to to make enough money to put food on the table and to pay bills and to not get kicked out of their apartment. And I, I can just imagine that it's harder for them to see life as a game mm -hmm. than it is for somebody else that that probably has more security in life. Totally, and I agree with you to a large extent. And I think, like we're we're all playing the same game, and we're not right? Because of privilege and because of this birth lottery that we just arrive onto the planet with a group of people who raise us in a certain location that's quite random, depending on your religious or spiritual philosophy. Like we just show up, right? Hey, here's who's going to teach you about life. And of course, based on superficial characteristics related to skin color and wealth and status and geography, certain individuals in this game of life have won against others from day one, right? I think that's pretty straightforward. And that sucks. And it also means that individuals have a different set of rules for the game of life, right? So I would still contend, and I still believe that all that we can do is learn the rules, so to speak. And that might just be accepting where we are right now and what we have right now. So for example, if you're working in a job that is a that you really don't love and you've got some debt and your family is a nightmare 
and your, you know, crazy uncle John is making your life miserable. Awesome. Those are the rules of the game of your life right now. And you get to decide of those rules, you know, what things you can change and what things you can't change. And those rules form a kind of boundary or a box in which you get to operate. So yeah, you might not be able to change crazy uncle John, but you do get to decide how and when and where you get to interact with that dude. And it might be a hard decision to say to crazy uncle John, yo, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I mean, you would say it kinder than that, of course, but like, you don't have to talk to uncle John. Like if you don't love your job, you can look for other jobs. Like if you, you know, are feeling overweight or unmotivated, you can jump on Google and choose to learn some shit. You can, you know, wake up 10 minutes earlier and do some push ups. So, so I think that there are always options. And I think that our mindset is a large, if not entire determinant of how our game is kind of played or won. And so when I said earlier that you get to decide what it means to win, that I mean that quite literally, like you get to decide what success means to you. You get to decide what enough is, you know, you get to decide how you spend your day and your time. Those are, those are true, right? Like those things are inarguable. And so, yeah, you have struggles. If you're listening right now, you got a whole lot of shit going on. And so does every single other person, right? And I've met poverty stricken people in, in African slums who are way more happy than some of the rich people with PhDs that I've come across, Mm. right? And so this goes back to the idea of how do you determine what success is for you? Do you determine success like by the amount of digits in a bank account? Or do you determine success by how you feel moment to moment experiencing life, right? And so for me, I would argue that some of those people that I've met in Africa are way more successful than some of the rich, educated people I've met who hate their lives and are on antidepressants, you know? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I love the philosophy that you were all playing a game. Yes. I mean, this idea of birth lottery is fascinating. We don't choose this life. I mean, we choose, we do choose this life. We mm-hmm. don't choose where we start from. Right. And we don't choose our parents and we don't choose how they raise us no. to a certain degree. At some point, we go, whoa. Yeah. This doesn't work for me anymore or I need to do it I need to do this differently. Mm-hmm. And we all we all eventually leave at some point and start to do it on our own. Mm-hmm. And we start to make choices, different choices. Mhm. Yeah, like my uh one of my favorite authors is this dude named Tom Robbins and he has this great line which is it's never too late to have a happy childhood. It's that. I mean, at some level, you get to reframe or reinterpret or, you know, learn from all of the experiences in your life and choose how you use them, right? And so your tragic upbringing that was surrounded by trauma and pain and lack and all of these terrible, quote unquote, negative things is in and of itself just a thing. Like it's not inherently good or bad, right? It's bad if you decide that it's bad, but it's good if you take the empowered stance and learn from it and use it as fuel. Like if you use your pain and turn that into passion and purpose and you, you know, overcome and you teach people about what you've learned through your life experience, like it could be the foundation for greatness, right? And we just don't know how things are going to play out is another sort of core philosophy of mine. I love this word, maybe. And there's a few like Zen parables that play on that of like, maybe like, oh, congratulations. You're so lucky. Like, maybe. I don't know. Like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Your business failed. You must be devastated. Like, maybe. I don't know. The worst thing that has happened in my life in the past has ended up 
resulting in tremendous power and lessons that I've used to create and encounter some of the biggest blessings in my life. Like my parents' divorce is one example that at the time I was completely devastated and shook up and I developed this weird twitch that I had to go to a child psychologist for. I was like six years old and it, it really fucked me up for lack of a better term. And, you know, 20 years later, I was having a conversation with my sister in which we agreed that my parents' divorce was one of the best things to ever happen to us because it meant that I got five new siblings, two new parents, a couple sets of grandparents, and, you know, tripled the amount of people in my life that loved me and that I loved. And so given enough time and perspective, I'm fairly confident that virtually anything can be overcome. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> in the present moment, I have an appalling lack of perspective. Okay. On what's going to happen. I, I, I didn't mean like right now about this interview. I meant like in, 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 in any situation. Yep. I don't know how it's going to unfold. Nope. And I teach this often, this idea that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how it will play out. Mm. And we don't know whether it's going to be good or bad. And it's not even worth putting a label on it. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it is. And it's going to unfold the way it's going to unfold. And I have spent a lot of my life trying to control everything, mm -hmm. including people, which is the hardest thing to control because... They fucking do whatever they want. <laughs> yep. It's a disaster. It's a disaster to try to control people and things. And my life has gotten measurably easier, more connected, more loving, with a softer touch every time I relinquish control. And every time I pretend to know how it's going to unfold. Or every anytime I try to make it unfold the way where it, it favors me. Mm -hmm. When I let it all go and I let people do what they want to do. And I do what I want to do without affecting other people. I stay present. And for me, that's the work. The work is always to stay present. Agreed. And to... To assume that I don't know what's going to what's gonna happen and how it's going to unfold. And that I trust that it's going to unfold. That we know. <laughs> Unless we die. And then that story is over. And that's okay. Yeah, man. I, I think that death is one of the biggest motivators around. For exactly that reason. That I might die today. I mean, it would be awkward for this podcast when you have to post it to the world. But like, I might get hit by a bus later. I might have a heart attack. I might fall off a roof. I might just like, my brain just might be like, nah, I'm done. This is possible. And not only is it possible, it happens literally every day around the world to, I don't even know how many countless people who just suddenly leave the game, right? It's like game over, you're done. It's like, boop, you're done. And so for me, I think that death is a grand motivator because it conveys this kind of temporary, like it limits everything. And so you could, in some instance, say, I'm going to die. You know, what's the point of doing anything? Nothing matters, right? I'm going to die. What's the point? Nothing matters. Or you could say, I'm going to die. I can do anything I fucking want. Nothing matters right? It's just that little middle, middle bit, that little contextual interpretation becomes either a constraint, a ball and chain, or just this liberating, joyous freedom, right? And so, yeah, you're all listening to this. Guess what? You're going to die. It's inevitable. And how do you want to live your life? Like, you should just try some shit. Like, nothing matters. Like, write the book, quit the job, you know, tell the person how you really feel. Pick up the guitar, paint the painting, like whatever. Do the damn thing. And to me, that is one of the most empowering things that I've learned and sort of operationalized in my own life is like, we're all terminal cases. We're all 
we're all dying like right now. And so what better way to spend your time than to live, like to truly live, like whatever it is that you want to do, go and just fucking do the damn thing. I, I don't know. I, I can rant on this for a while, this idea of death, but I, I think that at a profound and fundamental level, we need to understand that we are in control of our mind. And with that, like, like that's the secret to the game. Like that's the hack, you know, like in a video game or any kind of a game, that's the like top secret, secret code that will like level up and give you infinite power or infinite lives or whatever. It's like, Hey, guess what? Yeah. This game's fucked. And like everybody dies. And like the game's also fucked because not everybody starts on the same level or with the same weapons or the same tools or the same knowledge. Like, yeah, that's pretty fucked. Right. But guess what? Like you get to decide however you want to live your life, period. And nobody can take that shit away from you. Like what's going on between your ears? Like that's the, that's the game. And as you, as you said, the more that you kind of give up control and release the need to, to decide everything and what's going to happen and just operationalize trust and freedom and surrender to whatever is going to happen is going to happen for you and not to you and it's happening through you, et cetera, all the, all the cliches in woo-woo land. I mean, it, it becomes fun. It just becomes this sort of enjoyable present moment experience in which you embrace all of it. Of like, I don't need to be happy. Like, you know what? Today sucks. I feel miserable. Awesome. That's so awesome. That's part of life. And when we accept and embrace that the entire spectrum of human emotion is a core and essential part of our lived experience. Like you don't get to just choose the happy, blissful, joyous shit and pretend that all the rest of it doesn't exist. It's like, nah, you have to embrace the suck. Like it's going to find you. You're going to suffer. And that's okay. That's just part of it. And so I think that for my own life, I try to embrace the suck. Like that's a, that's a mantra that I use often in ter- as well as like maybe and all that. It's just like, well, it's raining. Oh, well, like, can I change that? Nope. Can I love that? Yep. All right. Well, not, not a real, uh, you know, effective, efficient, pragmatic choice to whine about the rain when I have no influence over the rain. All that I can control is the story that I tell myself about what the rain means. And I can just embrace the suck. Like, well, better grab an umbrella. The end. (laughs) Like, put a jacket on, put a jacket on. Life's going to rain on you sometimes. Like, bro, talking to myself all the time. Like, bro, what are you doing right now? Like, why are you complaining about the rain? Like, why are you complaining about this traffic? You are the traffic. Your car is in it. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Also, you chose to drive right now. You chose to drive right now. You chose to live in a place where it rains sometimes. You don't like the rain. Go live in the fucking desert in the middle of nowhere and just embrace the sun. No traffic. No traffic. It's a bonus, right? <laughs> We're on to something. <laughs> oh, man. the uh, This concept of death as the ultimate motivator, I love. I love it. Awesome. I sometimes ask myself, what's the worst that could happen? Yes. Death. <laughs> death. That's the worst of <laughs> everything that yeah. could ever happen is I die. Yeah. And I'm going to die. Yeah. Not only am I going to die, everybody I know is going to die. Mm-hmm. And you talked about this recently, you know, the three outcomes of any relationship. <laughs> I love that because I've been telling people this, not in a morose way, but all of your relationships will end. Mm-hmm. Every single one of them. Either your partner will leave you or you will leave them Mm -hmm. or one of you will die. Yep. Those are the only three outcomes that I can think of. Mm -hmm. And some people are horrified that that's (laughs) the way it's going to be. And for me, that's incredibly liberating. Yeah, those are the rules of the game, right? And like you can hate those rules all you want but it's not going to make your life any better because you can't change those rules. Some rules are built in. And the hack of 
you are your thoughts, even though this is very paradoxical. And I love this idea of dialectics. Dr. Alexandra Solomon talks about this. Everything is a, is a paradox. You control your thoughts. You're also not your thoughts. When I'm driving and I think about yanking the wheel into oncoming traffic, which happens quite regularly, mm -hmm. I don't really want to kill myself and the family of four in the opposite lane. I'm not that thought. Like I have it. My, my mind generates thought. That's its only purpose in life. Yeah, there's a big difference between wanting to kick a screaming toddler on the airplane and actually kicking a screaming toddler on the airplane, right? A big difference. And you, you mentioned Alexander Solomon's work, and I love her. She's amazing. And, and if you're listening, check her book out. It's called Loving Bravely. And she has this really succinct way of summarizing all of what you just described. And uh, it's both and, right? So you can be both sad and excited. You can be both, you know, intimidated and stoked. You can feel all the things. And that's why life can feel a little bit tricky at, at times. Like you can be both grieving and laughing, right? And that's okay. This is totally okay. It's just part of this mysterious thing that we all get to experience together, right? I have a therapist, had a therapist, Dr. Jay Talkoff. I bring him up every now and then. I first of all just love that his name is Talkoff. <laughs> um, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man. One of the the best nuggets that I ever got from him is that having multiple competing emotions about any one thing or situation or person is a sign of emotional maturity. Hmm. It means that we're not black and white. I don't love you until you fuck up and then I hate you. Mm. I love you and I'm really disappointed that happened. Mm -hmm. Or I love you and I hate this moment. Yeah. And I think this is why, why life is tricky, right? So I, I wrote this line a while ago that was, courage is knowing it might hurt and doing it anyway. And stupidity is the same. And that's why life is hard, right? And so sometimes you might feel like you're brave and, and you might also feel like you're a bonehead. You might be like an idiot, right? And so this contrasting emotional landscape presents challenges, right? Because sometimes you could say, I love you and I'm leaving. I love you and I'm breaking up with you. I love you and I cheated on you. I love you and I am love myself more, so I'm leaving, right? And and as you say, like, it doesn't have to be this black and white experience and, and the shades of color, the shades of interpretation make things very challenging for us to decide what's right, what's wrong, what, uh, what's true, what's not true, et cetera. And we just go round and round and round in circles trying to figure it out. And that's living, right? And this actually comes up. This comes up often and it comes up in my life too of really not wanting to make the wrong decision. Mm. Right. And people spend an incredible amount of emotional and mental energy trying to figure out what is the ultimate best move for my life and for this situation. And people will drive themselves crazy for months and months instead of just taking a decision. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we came up with is this is also a good choice. Whatever thing I choose, it's also a good choice. The other thing was also a good choice. <laughs> so just fucking pick one mm -hmm. so that you can liberate yourself and you can free up all of that energy that's been trapped going over and over and over all of the options and all of the pros and cons, which basically just keep you in the status quo, keeps you in that that situation and it doesn't allow for any sort of freedom or expansion. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. This is also a good choice. It might not be the best fucking choice, mm -hmm. but it's totally acceptable. Yeah. The, the, the idea that there is a wrong choice is in itself a belief, right? That's just a story that you're telling yourself that there's a right choice and a wrong choice. And if you just let go of that belief, and choose a different belief, which is 
there are no wrong choices. And just as the same thing that there's no such thing as failure, there's no such thing as ready. You either win or you learn. And if you learn a whole bunch of stuff, but don't win, then how is that possibly a failure? Because you're better than you used to be. And so I love what you just said, and I totally agree with you. And I also think that one way that I use with clients to help them sort of work through this battle, this internal battle, right, is to use kind of hypotheticals, right, of if you knew that everything was going to work out for you, what would you do? If you imagine the bravest, most courageous, most compassionate, best version of yourself right now, what would they do? I, I like this idea that heart whispers and fear shouts. And so that deep down, if you get still enough, if you get quiet enough, there's this little whisper inside our gut, our intuition, whatever you want to call it. And our heart is just whispering at us like, psst, hey, psst, like quit your job and move to Morocco, whatever. And then our brain, our, our head, it starts shouting, starts screaming at us like, that'll never work. What are you doing? You're crazy. You're a lunatic. You're a failure. You're not good enough. What will your mom think? That's madness. We can't do that. And then meanwhile, the heart's just going, Psst. you know, maybe every couple of days, maybe you're in the shower and you hear it. Maybe you're right before you fall asleep. It keeps you up at night. And it's just like this little Psst. quit your job and move to Morocco. And it doesn't go away. Right. And, and I would argue, and I do argue actually with clients who tell me, you know, I just don't know what to do, or I just don't know what I want, or I don't have any passions. Bullshit. You do. I would argue that you do know what you want. And I would argue that you do know what is the best decision for you. You just don't want to admit that. Like you don't want to accept that because you're afraid of admitting that. And because you're afraid of taking action towards that dream, then you don't. And your brain will do these sneaky things that keeps you in these shame spirals, or you'll just do the pros and cons and you'll ask everybody you know for advice or you'll need to read one more book to get the full understanding of what you're trying to decide or whatever. And then suddenly, you know, five, 10, 20 years goes by and you're still miserable because you never actually did that thing. You never became a golf caddy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> at Morocco's <laughs> premier golf academy. <laughs> right? And it's so it's so true. You look at like any successful person, like uh, what's the the Harry Potter woman? I imagine that she was confronted with a few of these voices when you know she was writing a story about some child wizard who had magical powers that had a scar on his forehead or whatever. And I imagine a lot of people are like, "What are you doing? Like, you're not a writer. What? This is a dumb. This is a dumb book. Like, no one will ever read that." Harry Potter? What a stupid name. What kind of fucking name is that, Harry Potter? That doesn't sound like a powerful wizard. What are you doing, you idiot? You know? But deep down, she heard that little whisper going, Psst, this is fun. Like, write the book. And now she can freaking buy her own country and go live there and keep the haters out. You know, it's just like a global franchise. You spoke of the fear of, of taking action. Mm-hmm. And that's huge. I think that's huge for a lot of people. Because if you admit to yourself that you're going to go move to Morocco to become the best uh, golf caddy in Morocco, mm -hmm. well, you got some work to do. <laughs> you got to figure out how to fucking leave your current life. You got to figure out how to become a golf caddy. You got to figure out everything about Morocco. You got to get the funds available. You have to say bye to all of your friends. You have to make new friends. You have to learn Whatever, Moroccan? I don't know. What do they speak over there? French? I don't know, man. But, but you're right. You, this is what happens. If you do not dream, then you are staying small and you're hiding, right? Because if you do dream and you do accept that what you want is not what you have currently, then you have to admit that. And if you admit that, then you accept that you have to actually take some action towards that thing that you actually want, right? And if you've never had that thing, the taking action is terrifying because you don't know how it's going to work out. There's lots of uncertainty to face and you're just going to have to figure it out. And as you just alluded to, Sean, you're going to have to be a totally different person. 
you're going to have to learn new things. You're going to probably have to shed some relationships in your life in order to expand and become a person who attracts new and empowering people. You're going to have to go somewhere you've never been. On some level, that is a tremendously stressful and uncertain situation, right? And at another level, that's exciting as fuck. That is a crazy life. Like, think of all the memories you're going to make and who you're going to become. And wow, you might be, you might be the next Harry Potter author, JK uh, Rowling. That might be you. Who knows? You just never know. Or you might just go to Morocco and hate it. And then what? You go somewhere else and you start a different life. And you're like, hey, you know what? I once moved to Morocco to chase a dream. You know what people say when you tell them that? They say, damn, that's awesome. You're a badass. I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. Tell me about that. I lived in Panama for a year. I started a hostel for motorcycle and overland travelers that were going to cross the Darien Gap. (laughs) Like, how cool is that sentence, Sean? What? (laughs) I didn't love it. I didn't love it. I mean, it was a great experience. Guess what? I also learned Spanish along the way. Yeah. And then I rode my motorcycle around South America for a year. God, that sucks. I bet you hated that. Because everybody kept on coming by the hostel with their motorcycles and they were going to ride it around for all around South America. And I was like, oh, well, gee, I want to do that. Mm-hmm. And I never would have done that if I hadn't said yes to fucking trying to start a hostel in Panama City, Panama. Yeah, that. And so at some level, it involves letting go of the desired outcome because expectations are projected disappointments. And you just embrace whatever it is that you desire to do. And so that might feel like, you know what? I have no idea why I'm supposed to move to Morocco, but I'm just supposed to move to Morocco right now. I don't know. I don't get it. But my heart is just like, I'm supposed to do this thing. I don't know why I'm supposed to write this book about this child scarred wizard thing, but I'm just supposed to do that. And the more that we can live in a way that acknowledges and honors our heart's whispers, magic happens, period. The the world gets out of your way. The universe conspires to throw wild and whimsical adventures at you. You meet the right person at the right time. It just becomes a game, like literally a game. And you can't even believe how it's going. <sighs> You also believe in the in the universe conspiring with people, not against them? I believe that whatever you believe is going to be borne out as true. I believe that you find what you seek, right? And so if you look for evidence that the universe hates you and is in your way and is throwing obstacles in your face and it doesn't want you to do that thing, you will prove yourself right. And I believe if you think the opposite, If you believe that the universe is on your side, that it has your back, and that somehow life is going to work out for you, you will start to see the reasons, uh, you will start to see that borne out as well. You will prove yourself right. And so, for example, you might, you might spend an entire day going through life and only seeing the assholes, the traffic, the puddles, the um, rejections, etc. Or you could go through life and you'll notice the reflections in those puddles that are really beautiful, or the one nice guy at the supermarket that put a smile on your face, or you'll notice like a couple holding hands in front of you and how that's a sweet and tender reminder that love exists. And the idea again of like, you find what you seek. And so I don't know what kind of cosmic shit is at play. All I know is that I am this ridiculously tiny and insignificant collection of stardust on a planet that's blasting through space in the middle of vast, infinite nothingness around a fireball. And perhaps, perhaps, I just don't know what the fuck is going on. And uh, that is really cool. (laughs) Like, when you zoom out far enough at your own existence, I believe that you start to understand what a miraculous thing it is to exist here at all. I don't know. I just kind of trust that if I'm here, if I made it this far to exist and to just experience this stuff and I can see and taste and love and laugh and, you know, I've got some 
money in my pocket and my bank. And like, yeah, I've got some fears and doubts and trauma from my past that I still need to work through. But like, it's all going okay. Right? I was never fully dropped on my ass. Yeah. By the universe. Mm. Never fully. Yeah. And when it felt like I was dropped on my ass, like you said, you have to learn from that experience. Mm -hmm. Or else it was a fucking waste. Yeah. And like a full ass dropping to me is death. Like that's it. Yes. Everything else is manageable. Like, oh man, like you got your leg chopped off. Well, that's a fucking bummer. But like, good thing you got another one. Or like, what a blessing that we live in a place with modern science and modern medicine that you can just like pop a pill and kill some bacteria or that you can like, you can take your leg off and still live. Like they're doing transplant surgeries where you can literally have your heart cut out of your body and they'll just grab a new one from some person that just died and they'll just put that thing in your chest and call it good. And like, like that's a fucking thing that happens, right? Like we live in a wonderful mystical time. The heart you just got though, by the way, yeah. that person was fully dropped on their ass. That person lost the game. <laughs> and guess what? Because of that, like you were able to keep playing, right? It's insane. And if you chop your leg off, perhaps you should stop trying to juggle chainsaws. Yes. You can learn from that shit. Do something different. Yeah. One of the most marvelous things in the world that's never talked about is that we can heal. Right? You cut your arm. It just heals. You get heartbroken. You can heal. Like, it's okay. Yeah, it'll take some time. And yeah, you'll hurt and blah, 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 blah. And you'll feel shit and miserable and whatever. That's fine. Like we all go through that. And it doesn't last forever. And you heal and you learn and you grow and you get better and you get wisdom. And like if you learn appropriately, hopefully with the right uh, endeavor and sense of purpose and dedication, you minimize the chances that you'll ever experience that again. And that's all you can do. You know, people really don't like heartbreak. No. They really don't like it. No. I kind of like it. <laughs> what, what do you like about heartbreak? I like I like the feeling. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> I like to feel emotions. Hmm. And heartbreak is raw. Yeah. And it it hurts, and it's also really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm, my work is all around emotional intimacy, so it's about feeling your emotions, and heartbreak cuts through all of your walls, all of the little things, the little fortifications, the barriers that you're propping yourself up with to keep, to help you keep going mm. and to keep playing heartbreak cuts through it all. And it brings you to your knees mm. and it forces you to feel. Mm -hmm. And when you are forced to feel heartbreak, you can feel other emotions. Mm -hmm. It brings it all to the surface. Everything now is playing you have a lighter skin, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's almost like your skin is, is translucent. It's made of papyrus. It's fragile. Things can enter. Mm. You're more open. Ugh. I love breakups and I love heartbreak. Yeah. Yeah. My buddy, Mark, uh, Mark Groves has this great line. He mentioned to me yesterday of, uh, he's going through a breakup right now. And, and somebody said to him, you know, I'm sorry, your heart's broken. And he said, it's not broken, it's open. Like, it still works. Like, it's ticking, it's letting me feel so beautifully. And, and he also was alluding to this idea that, like, pain is, is kind of the, pain is the price of admission for love, right? And, like, the more that you love, the more pain that you're potentially exposing yourself to. And, and as you suggested, both are beautiful. And, you know, the the greater the pain that you can experience in life, the easier it is to experience lesser pains, right? Like if, like if you've been absolutely shattered in a relationship, heartbroken, brought to your knees, when you sort of fall and skin your knee, it, get, it puts a little perspective on things, right? Yeah, if you, you lose a leg, that hurts a lot. If you skin the other knee, that hurts a lot less when you have 
perspective. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and yeah, this idea that when we open up to pain, we also open up to love. Yeah, and it's all it's all fuel, right? I mean, think of how many great songs and plays and movies have been written as a consequence of extreme pain and heartache. Some of the favorite things that you love, if you're listening right now, are a direct consequence because someone got absolutely shattered by life and decided to write about it or create something from it. And that's beautiful. And that was their way of playing the game. Mm -hmm. Yep. They didn't just stop playing. I guess you can also stop playing. Mm -hmm. If you feel like there's too many challenges coming your way, you can stop playing. Yeah. I mean, and, and you could do this consciously or subconsciously, right? I mean, you could just avoid, you could numb, you could drink beer and wine and just spend your time watching Netflix or or millionaires kick a ball, which I actually, I love watching millionaires kick a ball. It's, it's a hobby of mine, <laughs> but I think, I think like at a core level, you know what I mean? Like, it's so weird. I'm like, uh, sorry, sorry. I can't uh, meet you at this time on this date because I, um, I really want to watch these strangers who I'll never meet who are millionaires. Um, they're each going to kick a ball for an hour and a half. And I, and I'm really emotionally invested in that outcome. It's just like sports is the weirdest, but I love that. And so for me, it's like, it goes back to the idea of being intentional about how you spend your time. Like, like I'm being intentional that I like genuinely for whatever dumb reason, just love that it fulfills me. And I'm not choosing to watch sports because I'm avoiding my job, my relationship, my pain, et cetera. And so there's a place for, for everything. If it is done for reasons that fill you up, light you up, you know, help you become your best version of yourself. But I think, as you say, a lot of us avoid the game of life by hiding or we convince ourselves very like our brain is so sneaky and we, we concoct these stories and these tales and we call them true. And we just have entire fictions in our minds of to, why we can't do that thing, why we shouldn't try to do that thing, why we actually don't really want to do that thing, etc. And so then we don't play. And then so if we got that goes on long enough. We get really grumpy and angry and annoyed at the people who are winning the game, right? And because deep down, we know that we have betrayed ourselves and our dreams and that we're not even playing. And that hurts the most. Mm. Yeah, it's sad. Super sad. Giving up is sad. And, you know, I'm just thinking about this concept of comparing, right? So when you see other people winning, it makes you even more sad. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea that whenever I'm comparing myself to somebody else, I'm losing. I always lose because I only compare myself to people like Elon Musk. <laughs> right? And so I'm going to lose. Yeah. I don't, I don't ever compare myself to somebody who has less than me. Ever. Right. Every time I play the comparison game, I lose. The only way to win at this game, mm -hmm. the only way is to compare myself to me six months ago. Mm-hmm. I'm always winning. Yeah. I'm always doing better than I was six months ago, no matter how awesome I was doing then and how shitty I might be doing today. Six months is a long enough time for me to actually be doing better overall and to have learned more stuff and to have worked on some of my traumas and, and some of my deep, deep core fucking wounds and to have done, made some progress in my life where I actually feel good about what I've accomplished. Mm -hmm. But when I look at Elon Musk, <laughs> I'm losing. So I don't look at Elon Musk. Or I look at him, I just don't compare myself to him. Yeah, well said. It's that. Like, we're all playing a game with who we used to be, right? And it's a very slippery slope to start looking around at how everybody else is playing the game. Because we don't actually know what's really going on inside their heads and hearts. Like, even Elon Musk, like... We don't really know how happy that dude is or how fulfilled he feels or it, who he compares himself to. Like Elon Musk, for example, hypothetically, might look at some dude that works 40 hours a week and has a family and just easy peace of mind and be like, man, that guy's killing it. I, he only works 40 hours a week. Like he has so little responsibility or, and that guy can go to the supermarket and not get recognized. You know, what a, what a wonderful life he's living. We just don't know. It's like, maybe. 
that guy has time to watch millionaires kick a ball. Yeah, man. Like I feel so blessed, Sean, that, that occasionally I can pay somebody to cook me food. I'm like, you know how fucking cool that is? I feel like a king. Like back in the old days, like only kings could have that. Like everyone's like, oh, I wish I had a private chef. And I was like, you have like a billion private chefs. Like, you know how many restaurants are in this city? That just feels crazy. And, uh, and it's, again, it's about like framing and the perspective that I choose to view things through. Like, yeah, I don't have my own private chef. And like, yeah, that would probably be super fucking cool. And especially if they had some badass bomb banana pancake recipe that they know how to make just the way that I love it. But like, I can go and, uh, eat anything a couple times a week and feel great. Cause that's the lenses I'm choosing to, to view my life through. As an aside, I would love for us to have a private chef for like an evening at some point in the future. And I'm going to make that happen. Like we could pay somebody to cook us food while we just talk nonsense in life and just laugh and enjoy our lives. Isn't that cool? It'll be served to us while we just talk. Somebody will bring us food and they'll say, sorry to interrupt, guys. Is there anything else I can bring you? Do, would you like some more soda water? And I'd be like, you know what? That'd be fantastic. Can you please bring me more soda water? Oh, also, do you have a fresh picked lime and that I could have a slice of? to flavor my soda water and then she'll say or he'll say indeed sir and then we'll just be going back to talking about whatever we were doing and like they'll bring it to us it's crazy and the lime will come from a tropical country somebody will have grown a tree in a different country <laughs> paid somebody to pick the fruit paid somebody to pack it drive it fly it in a gigantic flying machine to a different country drive it to the restaurant cut it up and bring it to me. Like life is fucking magical, man. We forget, forget how crazy modern civilization is. Because we want more. We want more. Like go to the fruit section of your supermarket and read where the fruit comes from. It's crazy. It's like an international smorgasbord all year long. Every flavor you could ever think of. It's like, oh, yeah, you want a mango in the middle of winter somewhere? Oh, yeah, we can do that. No worries. It's $2. Like, okay. Maybe durian is going to be harder to find. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, one last thing that we need to touch on that you mentioned, which makes all of this possible. Okay. Because without this... None of this works. And so it would behoove us to give people the code. Mm -hmm. And you said it. And I know some people caught it. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking about right now. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. How can we listen to the heart's whisper Oh, if we don't get still? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I feel like the stillness and the silence is a requirement to listen and to feel, to actually feel what your body and your heart and your gut is really trying to tell you. I don't know of another, I'd be curious. Do you know of another way? I mean, there are exercises that you could journal on and you could go to retreats and talk to people and hire a shrink or hire a coach and things, but I think most of the important work that we can do as individuals is to actually sit down, get still, chill out, and just let ourselves feel, you know, how we want our lives to go and just admit that and learn to trust that day after day after day. There is no shortcut to getting still. Man. That is the shortcut. Yeah. I mean, I wish, I wish that I knew of a, seven step program that I could sell on the internet to provide that to humans. But every program that I sell on the internet to humans, one of the components is to start meditating every day. Like that's just part of what I believe to be true. Yeah, it's that. You already have all the secret codes. You already have all of the the big dreams. You already have the the skills and the resources like you're it like you come fully equipped 
you are the product of billions of years of evolution. Like you're a modern living, breathing miracle, like on a rock flying through infinite space. Like, like to think that you're missing that or that, like that that software was somehow not downloaded onto your mainframe or whatever the fuck computer technology means. Like you got it. It's there. It's in you. And the work becomes simply acknowledging that that is true and recognizing what you really want deep down and then admitting it and starting to take actions moving towards it. I, I think, I, I mean, I don't know of a, a simpler way to describe the game of life than that. It's like, just shut up and listen. And when you hear something, get curious. Meditation, getting still, is some of the hardest work that you will ever do. And it's not that hard. Yeah. It gets easier. It's really not that hard. You just have to fucking do it. <laughs> yeah. And, but that's what's hard, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> do it or die. Okay. Like in our world of distraction and instantaneous pleasure in your pocket, it can feel really challenging to do not. And like, I used to make fun of people that meditated. Like I was just little punk rocker from LA. I used to tease hippies. Now I got a nose ring and a man bun and I meditate every day and I'm like a vegetarian and I'm like, who the hell have I become? But I'm pretty content and I'm much more fulfilled than I used to be. And the way that I would suggest people start is to start as small as possible and to just commit to some kind of a challenge or an experiment or an adventure or whatever phrase feels good and easy. And just be like, you know what? I'm going to meditate for 10 minutes a day for 30 days. I'm just going to see how I feel. And like, what's the worst that happens with that? You sit in silence and chill out for, for a while? Well, you die. That's the worst. I mean, yeah. Well, thanks for taking it up a notch, Sean. It's, it's unlikely that you will die. <laughs> yeah. Choose where you sit quietly with your, <laughs> with your eyes closed. You know, make a, make a mature decision. Like, I don't suggest a railroad track, for example. Hollywood Boulevard. But yeah, just like find a comfy chair in your house or lay down on your bed or whatever. Set a timer and just try to focus on your breath and just observe the nonsense that your brain will shout at you. Like when I said earlier that your heart whispers and fear shouts, five minutes of meditation will be all the evidence you need to realize that your brain is a fucking lunatic that doesn't actually work for you. Right. And so the brilliance and the strength of meditation, in my opinion, is you are learning to control your mind instead of acquiescing and letting your mind control you. Period. Mm. I think that's all we need to say. That's it. Now just put the podcast down and set a timer for five minutes and meditate. Wait, don't put it down. Right now, we, we need another five minutes of wrap up. But after the, the full, when you hear the roll, the music, then put it down. Yeah. Or you, you just leave like five minutes at the very end of this. This is just blank silence. Like, this is your actual meditation time. Like, done. Oh, okay. I'll do that. We'll, I'll add 10 minutes to the end of the podcast. Yeah. There's a, there's a bell. Do not <laughs> stop before the end of the bell. <laughs> Wherever you are, just sit down somewhere and just sit and just chill. If you're driving, though, oh, yeah. pull over. Yeah. yeah, definitely keep driving uh, with your eyes open. Dr. Jeremy Goldberg, where can we find you? Yeah, I'm on uh, I'm on Instagram at Long Distance Love Bombs. I'm kind of mo most active there. I do have a Facebook page for Long Distance Love Bombs. I have a podcast called the Long Distance Love Bombs Podcast that uh, I need to get you on, Sean, at some point. There's a link in my Instagram that connects you to my, my online programs, my coaching. I wrote a book. I gave a TED Talk. I'm hosting retreats. I'm doing like all the usual personal development shit like I'm generally a part of. Um, but Instagram's the main one where I connect with people and, and write messages and stuff. Instagram is so great. So great. I'm glad that we connected through Instagram. It's fun, right? You can just pull this device out of your pocket and just have thousands of people at your fingertips.
I can DM Elon Musk if I want. You can. You you should. I will. I will. I'm going to tell him that I'm not. I'm no longer comparing myself to him, and there's nothing he can do to change that. Yeah. Nice try, Elon. But I'm done comparing myself to you. <laughs> okay. Last question. Yeah. What does love mean to you? Oh man, just uh, just a nice superficial one at the end here. Love means life. I mean, that's the word that popped in my head. Love is life. Love is power. Love is pain. Like love is just like life's secret sauce. You know, I think it's, I think it's worth doing. I think it's worth choosing. I think it's worth being like that question. What would love do in this situation is so powerful. And so in that way, I think love is a mentor, love is a coach, love is a guru. And, uh, I mean, really, is there anything better than love? I haven't found it yet. Yeah, you should do a podcast all about love. I'm not even looking for anything that's better than love. <laughs> like, that's the problem is like, why even try? I mean, we already know. Like, we already know all this. Like, it feels so good to, to be loved and to give love and to just like see the world lovingly. It's just it's the easiest, best way to live, in my opinion. And I'm going to seriously consider the suggestion about the love podcast. <laughs> yeah, you should you should do that. Something like with driving, like a love drive. I don't know. I think it could be big. Like um like libido for your heart or something like that. <laughs> Precisely. Thank you so much, man. Brother, thank you so much for your time and energy. This was a blast and I'm uh, I'm very honored and grateful to be here, man, and and just respect and appreciate what you do in the world and and thank you. And like uh Patrick Swayze says to Demi Moore in Ghost. Mm. Ditto. <laughs> what a way to end. Hey, lovebirds. Thank you so much for spending this hour with me and Jeremy this week. The November 7th group coaching program on emotional availability is pretty much sold out, but I will be running three more group coaching programs in early 2020. The topics are exquisite communication in your partnership, desires, needs, and boundaries, and how to open your heart to love. So if you want to find out about these programs, go to thelovedrive.com forward slash newsletter, sign up, and you will get those updates. You will also get twice weekly reminders that love is real because love is life. And I haven't found anything as powerful as love. Also, after this, five minutes of meditation, wherever you are. If you're driving, pull over. Spend five minutes just being still and quiet and try to focus on your breath. And when you start thinking about stuff again and you catch yourself, good job. You're meditating. Bring it back to your breath. That's basically all it is. I mean, you can go and read up more about this online. You could probably just type in how to meditate. And you'll get a whole bunch of maybe conflicting information about how to do it. But really what's important is that you just sit still and quietly without looking at your phone and you focus on your breath. And when you start thinking about it, it being anything, and you catch yourself, you say, good job. And then you go back to your breath. And after five minutes, when your timer goes off, you can pat yourself on the back and continue doing what you were doing. That's basically meditation. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. So there's no outro music, just this bell. And when you hear the second bell, you're done. Have a beautiful week.
Way to go, you magical meditator.